Dr. Kemra Jangid, uh, I welcome all of you, and I thank immensely uh, to the panelists who really, really kick-started uh, the conference with the first uh, inaugural session. Uh, a special thanks to the Ambassador Daniel Kalman and Dr. Shashi Tharoor and Professor Ranan Ryan. Uh, and I'm very, very happy that Professor Ranan said something wishful uh, that this is actually the beginning of annual dialogue and we will do the next dialogue in 2018. So this is uh, the first panel of the day. Uh, we have very, very important, uh, distinguished uh, speakers. India-Israel Political Crossings, uh, that goes the title of the panel, and the purpose of this panel is to capture the political crossings between India and Israel, uh, not only since the 1992, but what has been the larger uh, political understanding uh, between the two. Uh, let me introduce our three distinguished speakers. Professor P. R. Kumar Swami uh, is a professor at the School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. He was a research fellow at the Henry S. Truman Research Institute for the Advancement of Peace, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem from 1991 till 1999. Ever since joining JNU in September 1999, he has been researching, teaching, and writing on various aspects of contemporary Middle East. Let me acknowledge uh, one tremendous contribution of Professor P. R. Kumar Swami in the field of Israel studies. Uh, he's the only, and I, I, I would say he's one of the rare person uh, in Indian academia who has been mentoring uh, this subject. And I should acknowledge that I have reaped the benefits as his PhD student in JNU for five years. So it's a very special privilege for me uh, to have Professor P. R. Kumar Swami to begin the session today. His renowned work, I think uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Rohi Das Gupta mentioned in the morning, uh, India's Israel Policy, published from Columbia University Press in 2010, is one of the, one of the seminal works on the subject. The second speaker, uh, the Tsar Froim. The Tsar Froim is the minister counselor, Israeli embassy in Delhi, a good friend of the center and a very, very important person for this event today. After completing her schooling in her hometown of Petatikwa, which means Gate of Hope, she joined military service at Paratrop and infantry headquarters. She later received her BA in political science and Middle East studies followed by MA in strategy and security studies from the Tel Aviv University. Ms. Froim joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Her diplomatic career has led her to postings in Hong Kong, Athens, and New York. Currently, she's the Minister Counselor, Head of Public Diplomacy at the Embassy of Israel in India, New Delhi. Our third speaker today is very distinguished researcher, Bharat Karnad. He is at Center for Policy Research, a professor of National Security Studies. He has also served as advisor on defense expenditure for the 10th Finance Commission. Mr. Karnad holds a BA in Political Science from the University of California and an MA in Political Science from the University of California. So I welcome all the three speakers and I thank them to be part of this gathering. I invite now our first speaker, Professor P. R. Kumar Swami, to begin with. Thank you very much and good morning. And uh, these days, it's not nice to be from JNU. <laughs> and one gets all sorts of impression, but hope that you'll have a different opinion about JNU one we finish the session. And the problem with your former student is, you know, they tend to be uh, over enthusiastic in introducing you. So therefore, whatever Raj said is more out of affection and love, not an accurate assessment of the reality. And uh, my name is Kumara Swami. You know, these days Swami has a different prefixes, but, um, <laughs> and Sashi got a different prefix in the morning, but probably, it's, it's as long as the second name is Swami is fine with me. And uh, the title is strategic, 
but I think probably Professor Karnad will be a better position to talk about strategic, but I'm going to take you at a different uh, landscape. When you talk about strategic relationship, it normally you refer to an alliance, block politics, or even ideological convergence. That is so you have a strategic relationship between countries. This was somewhat easier during the Cold War because there is a block politics that after one could identify with one of the two blocks with very little need to actually choose. You are one or the other. The third world countries also in some way or the other were dragged to one of the group things. So therefore it was much easier. But today when you talk about strategic, it's much more complicated because you don't find countries agreeing on everything as it was the case during the Cold War. It's almost a selective engagement. You agree on X, but extremely differ on Y, and therefore the word strategic cannot be used as it was the case during the Cold War framework. But what we know is that whatever criteria you're going to use, there is going to be a substantial arms sale component in that, or other forms of military relationship. That is what makes any two relationship strategic. Sometimes you have such a cooperation among friendly states. But in certain cases, you will have certain cooperation in the military arena, even among not so friendly states. If you look at the media reports in the last few days, Israel has been participating in joint military exercises, which also had countries like UAE and Pakistan. So you cannot put these two countries as a friends of Israel, but still you have them, certain amount of military uh, cooperation is taking place. But what is very clear is, when you define a relationship as a strategic, there is a large component of arms trade. You could identify Israel's relationship, various countries, with this component. In some cases, Israel was a recipient. In some cases, Israel was a supplier. You can talk about US in terms of a recipient, China until 1992 in terms of the supplier. You also find the same thing with Israel and South Africa during the apartheid regime, and also Israel and Taiwan until Israel-China relations were established. You'll also find the question of Sri Lanka in the 1980s when both the countries did not have any formal relationship. And India is not an exception to this. But what you know is that, you know, in sum and substance, the depth of the relationship between two countries is normally identified or seen by the de depth of the military relationship. This is a normal thing. But there are certain inbuilt difficulties when you talk about Indo-Israeli strategic partnership. At a very minimum level, Israel does not produce and therefore does not export platforms, meaning aircrafts, ships, and even large such items like tanks. Israel's role is always the add-on in terms of technology and other advancement, not the platform per se. That's the first major difficulties. The second thing is, in, in a large number of Israeli exports, you have the American complement, either American funding, technology, or joint research. And I think that is why large number of Israeli exports get complicated when it comes to third countries. So US can say no to China and yes to India on the question of Falcon, not because of Falcon had any American technology, but because of the Israeli dependence on the United States, US gets enormous leeway in saying yes or no, whom Israel could actually supply, whom Israel could not supply. And what is happening is you have a new set of competitors for Israel. For a long time, France was a competitor in terms of Indo Israel, Indian air foreign export. These days, even US is becoming a major component. You're talking about F-16 being manufactured in, in India. So when you come to that kind of area, the ability of Israel to compete with the United States is extremely limited. And therefore, you're actually competing for a market. At the same time, US has much larger influence over Israel's policy. So therefore, if you put all of them, what Israel can do is probably what you can call technology multiplier. The force multiplier is probably what Israel is capable of talking. 
But when I'm talking about strategic relationship, I'm not talking about any of them. It's, I know you say that now, you explain everything, I say this is not what you're talking about, strategic. I think that's what it is. The academics have the levy of saying everything and actually going against their own arguments. So when I talk about strategic, we are not talking about the strategic military partnership. We are talking about areas which normally do not attract international or domestic attention, which is going to be the drivers in Indo-Israeli relationship. What I would call the soft areas. Areas which do not attract any media attention anywhere. You will probably find them in page 22 in a newspaper. Okay? It is not like a very attractive top, the headlines drawing issues. The issues are very mundane. Agricultural cooperation, articulture, floriculture, water management, drip irrigation, recycling, waste management, and desalination. And if you put that India is having a cooperation with Israel in water management, no newspaper will put it on the front page. I think that is where you are going to see the kind of relationship between India and Israel in the coming months and years. I think that is where you are going to find a redefinition of the word strategic. It is no longer going to be military, intelligence and security. It is going to be the soft areas which are going to be the real change is going to take place. They are not very attractive, and most of us will not even pay attention to that. It won't even gather any media attention. But I think they have certain inbuilt advantage. When you're talking about all these issues, the decisions are not taken in New Delhi. It will be taken probably in state governments where they are not concerned about the foreign policy issues. When you talk about in Delhi, they will say, what is your opinion on the peace process? Or do you support the settlement question? Do you support the, what is your Indian position on the question of Jerusalem? These are the issues will be dominating in the foreign policy discourse or in the strategic, in the conventional sense of the word. But when you talk about agricultural cooperation, and that's a state subject. So the states in India are going to carry out a, a whole range of interactions with Israel, which is within the domain, without getting entangled in the foreign policy discourse. I think that is where the shift is going to take place. And because it is about economy, development, and rural issues, they are not political issues. They are developmental agendas. I think that is where the real thing is going to take place. South Bronx will be important only when it comes to peace process and what do you do and all the other things. But when it comes to all the de developmental issues, it is the state governments which is going to take place. So when you talk about the state government, there will be less politics when you talk about development. And if you look at the Indian case, even in the last 1992 uh, onwards, various state governments have been engaging with Israel at a different levels. It is immaterial which party is in power. Punjab will cooperate with Israel whether the Congress party is in power or Akali Dal is in power. Maharashtra has been cooperating irrespective of which government was heading their state. This is applicable to right across the region. And even West Bengal, under the communist government, were actually taking part in cooperative activities with Israel. Jyoti Bas's last foreign visit as chief minister was to Israel. So therefore, you will find, the only exception I find so far is Kerala. But if you look at an Indian context, Kerala is always seen as an exception to any generalization of India. And probably, you know, when every state is cooperating, Kerala probably is the only state which is not joining the mainstream yet. Otherwise, irrespective of which party is in power, all the state governments have been cooperating with Israel in a whole range of issues, which is non-ideological, it is not political, it is largely driven by economy and local issues. With the result, what you're going to say, a very interesting shift. You're going to see a development or a support base for the Indo-Israeli relationship in the rural India. It is no longer going to be confined to intelligentsia sitting in Delhi who is going to say, okay, we should have a relationship with Israel because of X, Y, Z reasons. No. It is going to see a different type of support base where people who see the tangible benefits of cooperation with Israel are going to emerge as 
those who are going to support a pro-Israeli policy. I think it is not nothing to do with politics. This is going to be once again a D-link. If it, the morning ambassador mentioned, the bilateral relations has not impacted India's voting pattern in the United Nations. The same way, this is going to be not a question of rural India supporting Israel doesn't mean we are supporting Israel's position on all the issues of peace process. No. But what you are going to say is a kind of grassroots level which is going to support a much healthier, cooperative, development-oriented relationship with Israel. Which also means the urban India will continue to be driven by the BDAs and boycott and all the things because of intellectual bias. All you have to do is, when you have a time, come to JNU campus. You don't have to talk to anybody. All you have to see is, look at the walls and the posters. You will find out the kind of environment one lives there. So you'll find out. So, but when you're talking about a rural India, this is going to be a completely a game changer. I think that is why I'm going to look at it. The emerging relationship between India and Israel is not going to be Delhi-centric. It is not going to be urban-centric. It's not going to be driven by the elite. It is going to be driven by people who are going to see tangible benefits of a cooperative relationship with Israel. I think that is where the future trajectory of the bilateral relations is going to take shape. I think I'll stop at this point of time. We'll have a question and answer if there is anything. Thank you very much. Um. Stealing my time. I think you're stealing the lunch time, and this is far more dangerous. Um, no, that's uh, two hours well spent, I'm sure. Um, I'm in a bit tough position. I'm speaking after Dr. Shashi Tharoor. I'm speaking after uh, Professor Kumar Swami, who I often hear, and every time that I hear, I feel that I'm a student that learns something new. I am still. I am speaking in front of my professor from the University of Tel Aviv. Um, okay. So um, I'll try to to do my best, and um, I just want to say, Professor Kumar Swami, that um, I think that it is nice to be from JNU, uh, even in today's event, because I think that uh, there are uh, things that are changing. And uh, as you say, whenever I visit uh, the campus, I always enjoy looking at the graffitis. I feel that I'm um, moving in a time uh, machine to the 60s, uh, an area that, uh, a period of time that I read a lot about, and now I have the, experience, the, the chance to experience it. But um, I was never received uh, with a cold shoulder. I was never received with a hostile attitude. Even when we had a discussion with the participants that didn't see eye to eye with the policy that I represent, I think that there was always a willing to listen, uh, to interact. And I think that the changes are happening. They take one step at a time. But uh, I think that uh, the changes that you have referred to, uh, talking about uh, rural India, uh, can be also traced in urban India, in academic India. and. Um, Perhaps there is no better time than uh, today when we uh, celebrate uh, a milestone in the uh, diplomatic relation uh, to talk about uh, these uh, changes, talk about uh, the symbolism of uh, the date. It is a uh, symbolism that is a ceremonial. This is a, a, a half a jubilee, a time to celebrate uh, achievements. But it is also a, a symbol, but it is also a date that is a very practical because we don't just look at the successes that we had in the past 25 years. We also need to ask ourselves, where do we go next? How will we take this relationship to the next level? And what is the next level? So um, I refrain from uh, going back to antiquity, where the first contact between our people uh, are traced. I think that uh, Dr. Thoreau gave a very uh, detailed and eloquent uh, account of uh, that period. And um, I will also not go into the period prior to the diplomatic relation. I think, Professor, that you have touched it uh, briefly, but in a very uh, summative way. It is suffice to say that those ancient days paved way for cultures and philosophies to interact, and the old days paved way to new collaborations and eventually to the declaration on diplomatic relations in 19, 
1992. So looking back at the uh, past 25 years, one cannot ignore two notable shifts in our growing partnership. The first is its visibility, and the second, its scope. In international relations, visibility doesn't necessarily equal publicity in terms of PR. It has its own merit as a tool of diplomacy as well as its objective. The projection of a partnership, any international partnership, carries weight. Even after the establishment of full diplomatic relations, they were kept hushed, mostly by Delhi, as you have uh, rightly mentioned. To some extent, this could have been explained by the nature of the main item on the agenda on those days, which was defense. And to some extent, the explanation lied in the zero-sum game perception that was prevailing in Delhi for many years. You can't, go, you, you can't have good relations with Israel and with the Palestinian or the Arab world for that matter at the same time. For a while, this arrangement was acceptable to both parties. But time and circumstances have changed. Keeping a shy approach is no longer acceptable, and I think it is no longer an option. Normalizing the relations means adding symbolic uh, components, such as high-level and high-profile visits. Beyond being a ceremonial, they serve and they create platforms for more synergy, more activities, joint activities, and more achievements. We still have a way to go in that department in order to materialize the full potential of the relations, but at the same time, I think that we can all agree that there is no more lack of visibility. We may not have reached the full potential, but it is definitely not lacking. The enhanced visibility has to do also with the ever-growing scope of the joint agenda. As young states in the modern era, as young democracies, India and Israel have shared values, shared interests, and shared challenges. We can, we should, and we are working together to find shared solutions. Based on government to government, business to business, people to people, and every other level in between, we are engaged in a cutting edge diplomacy, diplomacy of development, or development uh, diplomacy. And as was mentioned by the ambassador and now by Professor Kumar Swami, the relations between India and Israel span today from security to food security, development to startup, water to space, Israeli innovations and solutions cultivated in a development laboratory. I think that this is perhaps the best way to look at Israel. Standing here in huge India, looking at tiny Israel, we should perhaps look at Israel as a development laboratory. So looking at the, uh, uh, those solutions that were uh, cultivated in this development laboratory, forged by adversity, they're adapted and tailored with our Indian partners to meet the needs of Indian challenges from the 15th Center of Excellence in the Indo-Israeli Agricultural Project across India, to Israeli technology used to clean parts of the Yamuna River, to an Israeli satellite placed into orbit by ISRO. India and Israel are striding together confidently into the 21st century. We can join with each joint project aimed at shaping better future for our nations, I believe, Israel is proving to be India's tried and tested technological partner. I also believe that today, facing the dramatic changes in the international arena, we have understood that in order to be sustainable, this partnership must be nurtured from the root. It must be encouraged at the stage of academic cooperation and from there, it spreads into every sector in the development of our countries and economies. Beginning by bringing our students and academicians together, we enrich one another and expand the horizon of our shared knowledge. Last November, we welcomed in India the Israeli president, President Rivlin. It was a landmark visit, and he was accompanied by a delegation, unprecedented delegation of 15 presidents and deans of Israeli universities and colleges. On that occasion, 
and in his presence, they signed, I think, more than 20 MOUs uh, with Indian counterparts, several with Jindal University, several by Tel Aviv University, and through programs cre created by such MOUs. And I think that today's event can be a good example and through various governmental and non-governmental schemes that offer scholarships and joint research grants, we are able to get to know each other better and to jointly shape the next generation of engineers, innovators, leaders, and economists who will define our countries and our economies in the year to come. It is important to note, though, that um, Indian and Israeli economies are incomparable. A quick look at the map will explain it. Uh, and, and why we could never compete, we complete one another. Israel is the laboratory and India is the factory. Israel's startup and innovation, always reaching out to the global market, can find natural partner in India. Israel was among the first countries to join Make in India with uh, factories here uh, producing Israeli technology even before the campaign Make in India had its name. Together, our two countries can generate innovations, the like of which both benefit our lives and our citizens, but can also change the world. Getting to know and appreciate each other, identifying new areas for collaboration, looking at the ever-growing and diverse agenda that we share we are celebrating 25 years of growing partnership, but we are also growing together with a hopeful look to the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, because it's the first such meet, I'm going to understand, uh, maybe I should speak anecdotally about historic events. This to set the context, really. Shashi Tharoor mentioned the friendship between Ben-Gurion and Jawaharlal Nehru. Actually, it got manifested in the first Asian Relations Conference in 1947, six months before formal independence. There was a representative of uh, Jewish Palestine, formally invited to be part of the first Asian Relations Conference. Now, what that was as a harbinger of good relations did not quite materialize in the formal sense of full diplomatic relations. India, by the way, uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, beat India to recognition of Israel um, because by the time the Nehru instruction went out to permanent representative New York, Soviet Union had already endorsed Israel's sovereignty as, and membership of the, of the United Nations. India was the second nation in the world formally to recognize Israel. It has been an intimate relations, a relationship, and it has curiously been entirely subsurface. Much of the diplomacy Israeli, Indo-Israeli diplomacy is shadow diplomacy, wars. It was in the shadows. And that meant, because it was in the shadows, that there's a great deal of latitude, actually, in what you could do. Because when you come up above surface, things become plainer. You also get constricted and restricted in your actions, because everybody can see what you're doing. When everything subsurface, you can do a lot of things and nobody is quite aware of them, isn't it? In 1965, when there was the India-Pakistan conflict, and I hate to call India-Pakistan conflicts wars, because I've analyzed in my writings, they're really more riots. And the aptest description of India-Pakistan wars are these are communal riots with tanks. But that said, the point to make is very simple. We ran out of ammunition. And sure enough, there was airlift of ammunition, artillery shells, chemical explosives, from Israel. If I'm not 
wrong, Levi Eshkol, who was the prime minister at the time, actually came in on a midnight visit to Mumbai. Nothing was reported. The point to make is, there was a great deal of strategic cooperation as a building block of our relationship. It was not civilizational values and the fact that India has been tolerant of Jewish people who have been refugees and so on, that we are. And that is the case historically and civilizationally. But it's also, I think there's this basic empathy, civilizational empathy, but that's a given. That need not be stressed. In, 19, in 1982, I think, when I first went to Israel, a long time back, or rather it dates me, it isn't all that long back, it merely dates me. There was a system of two passports. You may not know this. But when I went to the MEA and said I was going to Israel, they said, well, you must have a second passport. Because if you travel to... Uh, um, Israel and the Arab states see it, you'll not ever be able to enter Arab states. Now, I found that a little hypocritical, so I said, no, I don't care not to go to Arab states, I care to go to Arab states, but I'd like something on my passport. Then I've been to Israel, well, just a cussedness, I think. I, I was not particularly mature or wise. When I got to uh, the Lord Airport in Tel Aviv, the person there automatically handled, handed me, uh, instead of a visa, a little slip of paper. So there's no record of me ever going to Israel, incidentally, in 1982. That was the system of covert interaction existing at the time, not 30 years ago. One of the things that I remember, um, this was the Lebanon, the Lebanon war that Israel was in. I had gone into the first armored brigade, the Israeli first armored into Beirut at the time. And I was uh, staying overnight, uh, not overnight, for my stay in Israel in the kibbutz Kiryat Shemona, right on the border with Lebanon. And there I met the legendary intelligence, military intelligence chief who was called on reserve duty when the war began, Major General Aaron Yariv. And I spotted him because I've read the, I read Moshe Dayan's Sinai diary, war campaign diary, and I spotted General Yariv. He was in his full fig reserve. I introduced myself. And he was taken aback by an Indian being there during a war that they were prosecuting. And what he told me was the fact of an Indo-Israeli joint plan to bomb Kahuta, the Pakistani nuclear weapons complex at Kahuta. And I was taken aback. I was fairly plugged in into the Indian military scene here. Even so, this was so secret, it was told me, disclosed to me by Major General Aron Yariv. And it was a very beautiful plan. A combat air patrol of F-15s, the strike aircraft F-16s coming in over the Arabian Sea, rounding out into Jamnagar. The pilots resting and getting themselves fit for the final operation, with special ordnance being airlifted, because Kahuta is partly underground, so you have to have special ordnance. And mind you, just the year before, uh, they had bombed Osirak, so Israelis were experts. Now, this was planned. Now, can you imagine two countries planning a nuclear attack, basically, to preempt the emergence of a nuclear adversary? 
The presumption is extreme intimacy. That's the point I want to make. Not that the fact that the plan didn't quite work. It didn't work because like everything else, India gets cold feet at the wrong time. Invariably loses its nerve. We don't have the nerve for hard action. This is something that uh, uh, in, my, in the introduction was not mentioned, but I was a member of the first National Security Advisory Board, draft, part of the group that drafted the nuclear doctrine and so on. And some of the things that at the time we were discussing that, were, that saw policy content later, in fact, were aimed at achieving organic linkages. What do I mean by organic? You have formal linkages, state to state level. Organic is what Ditsa mentioned, what Kumaraswamy mentioned. You know, at the level of the grassroots, where people see the stake, become the stakeholders. But some of the ideas that I had propagated in the government at the time, I put in a paper that I was supposed to present to the University of the Negev in a seminar, which never happened incidentally, because the Intifada began two weeks before the seminar, and the seminar was canceled because everybody had to uh, go on mil military reserve and duty and so on. But the idea there was, and this is taking up on Ditsa's point, what is the next level? The next level is, and this is, I'm afraid, our relationship, and Ditsa, you might wish to note, and I remember I have talked an awful lot to previous ambassadors, Alon uh, Upshitz in particular, when he was the back in your foreign ministry, and before he became, and that's when I last gone to Israel, and then he came here as ambassador. The point is that India-Israel military relationship is unfortunately getting into a customer-buyer-seller relationship. I suggested to the then home minister, Israeli home minister, who, who was kind enough in, on one of his visits to visit me at my center, along with Shai Shabatai, the former chief Mossad, um, to consider the proposal I had made. And I think I remember sending him the paper, and I don't know what happened to it at your end. Um, but what I had suggested was very simply this. For Israel to be a manufacturer of all of its armaments, bulk armaments, where's the Markava tank, the guns, the artillery, the normal, where with all of all military services. I suggested that you have to have mutual stakes. You have to develop mutual stakes in each other's security. That is where things become very, very close. And therefore, these are not hostage to the passing political whims or currents or winds. You have to immunize the relationship against passing political developments. You have a convivial government now. You may not have it tomorrow in Delhi. That's the thing I said to Uzi Landau, the Home Minister, and to Shabatai, Mr. Shabatai. And what I suggested was that the bulk manufacture of most armaments that the military uses in Israel and in India be manufactured in India. And that the innovation, the technology innovation, that we invest in the Israeli effort at technology innovation for advanced armament systems to benefit both countries. 
obviously the idea intrigued a lot of people in Israel. I remember when Ariel Sharon came here. That's also a time when this was bandied about. The point to make though is, I'm not quite sure where the hesitation is, but it hasn't quite come to it. It hasn't quite been realized, even though there's absolute mutual interest. Now I'm not, unlike uh, people at the uh, table here, and I don't include you, did, sir. I'm not an academic. I'm not an academic. I'm a policy analyst, and what that means is that you think up policies that are beneficial to the country, that serve the national interest of both Israel and India. If the national interests of both are served, then you're on very firm ground. When there's a differential in the service of the national interest, the relationship tilts, and it may not be as strong as one would wish. So what are the other things? Now, this is the conventional elements I'm talking about. It hasn't happened, and I wish something would happen. Because this is the time when things are in transition. I'm just leaving for Bangalore in a short while. There's going to be the first uh, seminar there on the privatization of the defense public sector, Navratna, you know, the uh, BEML and so on. Now, the thing to consider is this. If we get this going, this is the next level, the next step. But what are the other areas? Space is an obvious thing. We have, again, nobody knows much about this, but we have very intimate relations in space. We put up your off-tech microsatellites. We do a lot of the basic interfacing. Now, off -tech, the off-tech microsatellites are necessarily low orbit. I'm sorry, if I get technical, I don't want to. I will not get technical. The idea of low orbit is that you have a look down uh, sea down capability for specific battlefields and so on, and that's what Israelis want. Now, there's also a strategic thing where you have a geosynchronous thing, and there I don't know, I'm sure Israel has it, but the point to make is that we can share a, a satellite constellation, put it up, to c cover the entire swath of land from the western Mediterranean to the South China Sea. You cover the regions of interest to both India, that's the footprint the satellite constellation will have. So you have about constellations, you need a minimum of about, what, 13 to 17 satellites, we are already up to whatever um, satellites for a look down, look see footprint for military surveillance, for other things. Um, and this is where, again, that we could have very intimate relations with Israel in building up a constellation. We are good at engineering, economically engineering satellites, geosynchronous satellites. You're very good in microsatellites. You can merge the technologies and get going. The other thing, and this would be very, very, and this follows on Aharon Yariv's Kahuta strike that didn't happen because India lost the nerve, is strategic cooperation in strategic armaments. Now, I'm, I don't know if there has been a Weizmann Institute and so on with our own Baba Atomic Research Center and so on, but if there isn't, if there is nothing like it, it should grow. If there isn't, that's also an avenue to explore. Because when you have, the, the point I think to make is that these are the kind of very intimate links and connections one needs to forge to ensure that the relations are enduring. Um, one thing, and I'll end on this note. I earlier cautioned that the India-Israel military security relationship should not get into a buyer-seller interaction because that's what every other military supplier is, and it becomes a very transactional relationship. It doesn't really create mutual gain. 
and it doesn't strengthen the links. It's what the aim is. Not just to make some money or to have a better bottom line for some companies, whether it's Elta or IAI or some company here. The question is, can we have ensure that both the countries are on the same grid, policy-wise, have the same, generally the same aims, and while they may diverge in the regional sense, and obviously um, they do, uh, that is irrelevant to the context and the larger scheme of things. But there is one if here, and this is what I worry about. I spent a good part of my life in the States, and as, this, as the idiom goes, some of my best friends are American. But the United States tends to be a, a dampener. If it doesn't serve US interests, they come down pretty hard on any country. Now, Israel is particularly vulnerable to US pressure. And I've always said that maintain this. And I've had this is a discussion I've always had with Israeli leaders in Tel Aviv and elsewhere, wherever I meet them, um, when I can meet them. Um, is what happens if the United States, as it was projected, it may, you know, that Trump is going to be less friendly. Certainly, it was said during the George W. Bush presidency that uh, the U.S. might be less friendly because it has other interests in the Arab states and so on and so forth. What do you do? What do you do um, if you condition our relationship on a U.S. veto? Should we allow it? No, obviously we shouldn't. Now, Israel, for Israel, I think it's a more sensitive issue because it depends so much on the US subsidies for its own defense industry and other things. But US is a player that, if we are really realistic and honest, we should try to minimize the US role in our part of the world for the very simple reason that the US is not going to come to Israel's help when push comes to shove any more than the US is going to come to India's help should we ever seminally require it. And the question is, can we make our relations independent of the United States? That should be one of the main aims that I worry about. One of the things that I try to, in my, in my work, I've tried to flesh out what we can do. Because surely there is enough evidence available in the United States, if you only look at it, that the US support for Israel can be very, very tricky, can be, is really very iffy. Dennis Ross, who was the Middle East in potentially was my USA, UCLA batchmate in something that's called Arms Control Simulation Unit, RAND UCLA, and that's what we worked on. Now, Dennis is plenipotentiary, the ambassador to forge peace in West Asia and so on for three presidents. Now, what I gather is people like him are very worried about the infirmity the inconstancy of American support for Israel. There's a deep fear that Israel can be, may be abandoned. This is something that Israel has to worry about, not India. But surely, with the US role increasing in India, which I think shouldn't be allowed, I spent, as I said, a good third of my life in the United States. I went there when I was 17 years old. The point to make is, the one thing I learned that I think the Israelis have learned too about the United States, that nothing is as important, nothing so sacrosanct as the national interest. You have no scruples whatsoever in pushing your national interest. And that is the ultimate, I think, metric to judge 
relations between states, how far are you willing to go in your national interest to strengthen it? Thank you. so much uh, in their own uh, time we have now. And now I invite uh, your questions, your comments. Uh. And I should also share with you that we deliberately kept three speakers for all sessions uh, and not four. Uh, we wanted uh, the, the best presentation, but then we wanted a significant time for you to participate with and not wait for the next presentation one after the another. So we will continue this session till 12.30 and then we have lunch. Uh, so we are quite on time. Uh, please, uh, please start. Begin, and uh, let me begin also with an apology that I'm, I'm not an expert in, in international relations, not an expert in, in policy studies. I'm a student of Indian philosophy who has been interested in Israel for the last 25 years, almost yearning for Israel. So I had the chance to spend a year there a couple of years ago, so I feel gratified. But um, uh, today, when I, I, I mean, uh, listened to two um, speakers who spoke between India and Pakistan relationship in terms of econom econ economics and strategic Mr. Kardard and Kumaraswamy, I thought both these talks were complementary to each other in the sense that I'll, I'll just ask the question before um, saying why they are complementary. While um, Kumaraswamy was giving a positive side of the relationship between Israel and India that you know, at a national level you can ignore the relationship and at state level there is a very happy, which is true of course, and while uh, Mr. Kernard was you know, giving his vast experience and through his writings that those of us who have read, how, what are the complications? <laughs> and what I liked about uh, your, your uh, presentation was that this, this diffidence that Israel has in really uh, taking the relationship further. Uh, I do feel, although I'm not an expert, that Israel does treat India as a market which I think every country in the world does, simply because of the sheer population of the country and also the intelli I mean intellectual uh, capacity to produce things and to, to buy things. So that is one thing. And by the way, I, I would have been very happy if Kahuta had been bombed. <laughs> so, so, that at least, but so, so, I, and so, so the, the problem therefore is how, how to, to, to ask you this question when uh, the uh, whether from the Israel side or sometimes from the Indian side, the, the um, hesitation that suddenly uh, arises at critical junctures, whether it is, as you quite rightly said, uh, under the pressure or under the perceived pressure of America, or I might say uh, the domestic pressure given the region where Israel is placed. Uh, that is one of the reasons whether it is only American pressure or, or interests of India to keep America happy that it is diffident from Indian side and from Israeli side it is clear that it, it depends on America for many reasons. So that is one aspect and to you of course uh, is connected uh, with the, the same question that there has been a relationship uh, economic and sometimes strategic between Israel and various states, independent of the national politics. However, the, mm, those relationships would not be somehow working if there was no uh, support from the center. So, so it is not that Israel and India can develop and maintain a vibrant relationship in economics and culture without uh, a support of the center. Now, what happened, I think, these three talks and, and, and three in the morning, uh, we know the, the trajectory of the relationship that, uh, that happened. So if you could enlighten uh, on these two very uninformed questions. Yes, as to why the government of India falters on the cusp of making important decisions that are ultimately to India's interests. 
Um, and this, mind you, the, uh, the hesitation on the Kahuta operation was Indira Gandhi. He was supposed to be a very strong leader and this, that, and the other. Uh, she was not exactly a Lal Bahadur Shastri or someone who supposedly was a weak leader. You have Indira Gandhi, who was like Margaret Thatcher, the only man in the cabinet, and so on. But the, this is the flaw, and I look more at India, really, in, in all my analyses. I look at the flaws that India, in a sense, uh, you know, the flaws that we project onto our policies and that hinder it, that ultimately also end up not getting us the benefits that should be coming to us, just naturally. Because we are hesitant, we are diffident, we are cautious, a whole bunch of things. We are simply not, and in my latest book, it's called Why India is Not a Great Power. And yet, and then there's my American editor put a yet in brackets at the end. So I told her, Hillary, but you, you are far more optimistic than I am. Uh, because my thing was very declarative. Why India is not a great power. And then she added a yet. She said, no, 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 don't get ahead of, my, of yourself. But the idea is it will really intrigue people and increase the sales. <laughs> the talk commercial. <laughs> now the point I think is it's true. India has all the potential. But as it was said of Brazil for many, many years, India is like Brazil always on the takeoff stage, never taking off, isn't it? I mean, we have been talking about takeoff since 50s. So I argue that it must be either a very heavy aircraft and therefore needs a very long runaway. And so we're endlessly on the runaway taxiing for the correct speed to take <coughs> off because less than that and you may crash. And we are simply not getting the lift off. Or we are simply underpowered. And I, is underpowered, underpowered notion is also of the will, the political will. Israel is such a small country, but it has the will. And I've, as I've argued, they have the will because they have such a small margin of error. You can literally cycle across Israel in a few hours at the belt. I've done it. Quite literally, it is ridiculous. We are a subcontinent, and that's why we feel, oh, what the heck, you know what I mean? If the enemy is at our gate, we can always go withdraw to Nagpur. <laughs> I'm kidding, but the point is, when you have a subcontinental mindset, you have the margin of error which doesn't impress on you. There's no margin of error. You have everything, there, you know, there's no such thing as annihilation. There's no notion of national annihilation when you're subcontinent sized. But for Israel, annihilation is a very real, immediate reality. That's why the very two different attitudes, that you don't want to take a chance. You don't want to say, like in Indians, we endlessly debate, we just discuss, ta -ta, you know, we just go on and on, talk, talk, talk. That's why I've said, we are the talk yogis. Well, the Israelis are karmi yogis. They don't talk, they do. And here we at Kahuta, in particular, it was they doing, we talking, and we still didn't let them do it. I thought we will have more questions. Okay, I especially want to take this occasion to thank uh, the students who have come from JNU, students who have come from Indian Society of International Law, and certainly the students of OP Jindal University, most of them who have been the volunteers. So thank you very much. Uh